Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, I know probably we have people from all over the place and for some of us, we're just starting our day and for others, we're ending. Um, so yes, uh, is our monthly webinar from the Prevention Collaborative on using the Common Elements Treatment Approach, or CETA, as you will hear us say, in reducing intimate partner violence and hazardous alcohol use in Zambia. Um, so I'm Kathy Durand, and I'll be moderating the webinar today, and I'm the Director of Strategy and Operations at the Prevention Collaborative. And the Prevention Collaborative is a global organization that aims to contribute to the prevention of violence against women and their children by making various types of high quality knowledge available, facilitating a community of individuals who learn from and with each other, and partnering with organizations to strengthen programming through application of evidence and enhanced adaptation. So as part of our strategy, particularly that part on community, we organize this series of monthly webinars on programs and approaches that are positively contributing to the prevention of violence. Today, we will be talking about a fascinating approach that had great results in the reduction of violence in households in Zambia and other places. I personally am particularly interested in learning about how the approach uses lay people to work with community members and what the, the team thinks are the core elements of this approach to be considered in adaptation. We have two people with us from the CETA project in Zambia today. Uh, we have Chambela Mukunta, Chambalelo Mukunta, uh, who is in Zambia, joined the Hopkins team in 2011 uh, in, 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 dip, in implementing the initiative. Uh, she joined us as one of the lay providers in Lusaka and she's now a supervisor and works with people who are adopting and adapting CETA in other countries like Myanmar. And we have Dr. Laura Murray, who's a clinical psychologist at Hopkins with significant expertise in a wide range of evidence-based treatments, including how to train and support lay counselors. She's the developer of the CETA approach and a leader in global implementation research related to mental and behavioral health. So thanks to both of you for, for joining us. Uh, Chambalelo and Laura will share details about the approach and the results of their study for the next 30 to 35 minutes, and then we'll have a Q&A for the remaining 15 to 20 minutes. Um, I did want to say also this initiative was part of the What Works program to prevent violence. Uh, and we have a few people from that program today, including Samantha Willian and Leanne Ramsamar from What Works. Uh, I'd like to invite Leanne, if she's online, um, to say a bit about what the What Works uh, and, and this particular initiative. So Leanne, maybe put up your hand so Sharon can see if you're there. Let me just see. Okay, I'm not seeing her right now, so why don't we continue? And uh, if she jumps in, maybe she, if she joins us, she can say something at the end of the presentation. So just going to hand it over to Sharon Ingueso, who's our comms associate at the Collaborative, uh, so she can share a little bit of information about how the webinar will run, and then we'll get into it. Thanks, Kathy, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, just a few quick words. If you're not familiar with Zoom, um, take your time to hover your mouse around. You'll see a couple of options available to you. The one that you'll probably be using um, throughout this call will be the chat button. So if you hover around your screen, if you're on desktop, it's right at the bottom um, of your menu section. Uh, the second last option just says chat. And if you're on your phone, it's right at the bottom also. Um, through that chat box, once you click it, you'll be able to uh, put in your questions or points for clarity throughout the webinar, which will then be addressed uh, during the Q&A session. If for some reason during the Q&A session, um, you would really like to vocalize your, your, um, your questions or your points for clarity, just um, mention that in the text box and I will make sure you're unmuted and you can speak to your question. Apart from that, should you have any technical difficulties or you know someone who's trying to join and having any technical difficulties, I'll be adding my email address to the chat box where you can um, copy and paste that or uh, use that whenever necessary to email me directly and I'll help you troubleshoot. Um, apart from that, if you need anything else, just again, you can use my email and I'll support you in that troubleshooting. Thank you so much. Um, and oh, my apologies, one last thing. This 
call this webinar will be recorded and um, uploaded online. So if you have any concerns about your voice or your 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 text being online, do let me know again just through email and I'll make sure that that's edited out. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Sharon. Uh, so now I'm going to hand things over to Laura and Chambalelo to um, share with us their um, experience. Wonderful. This is Laura Murray. Um, thank you so much for the introduction, Kathy, and for all the help, Sharon. We are thrilled to be here today with everyone. So um, why are we passionate about the common elements treatment approach? And I'm going to go ahead and let Chumbalelo start. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> thank you so much for having us. So I'd like to share a story of how, why I'm so passionate about CETA. As Kathy earlier mentioned, I started working with Laura and her team in the late 2011. And then when I just began, I was training one skill that, that would help treat trauma in kids. So as a lay provider going out to these communities, uh, we found families and adults facing other problems such as substance use, depression, and some experienced violence. It, was, it made me feel so helpless because there was nothing else that I could do. Being trained is just one skill. So when CETA was introduced, it was so refreshing because this is the need, help that we actually needed to be able to help the communities deal with the problems that were coming out. So thank you for that. Great. Thanks, Chambalelo. Um, so you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, and we just wanted to shout out a quick thanks to all of our sponsors. I know many folks are on from the What Works initiative, um, certainly the prevention um, collaborative and um, moving all of this forward. So we appreciate all of that. So without further ado, um, we can move on. So, um, and go ahead and um, just do all the, the clicks. Yeah, there we go. Oh, it looks like it's off screen a little bit. Um, that top comment is, is, what's the problem? And I think what we've run into is that in single focus treatments, there's a real implementation, a scale up and a sustainability problem. Um, Kathy, go ahead and click one more time. And one more time. There you go. Okay, so on the right-hand side, um, what you see here is um, a bubble of what most people present with all over the world. And that's just something we call comorbidity, which means it's very rare that someone comes in only with depression um, or only with substance use. Most individuals all over the world come in with multiple different problems. And what happens is, if you move to the left now, if we train people only on something like parenting, which might get at some you know, behavioral problems, um, we're not able to treat anything else. And in high-income countries, that might work because people have long histories of mental health training, they're licensed, they're supervised. In low- and middle-income countries, it's not a very helpful model. You see here binder after binder. And for those of you that work in programs, those are dollars after dollars of training and trying to upkeep staff and um, keep fidelity to all of these models that you're trying to balance just to address all the many problems. So go ahead to the next slide. So what's the solution? Um, and here what we have is a scientifically proven with multiple trials now, um, a treatment called CETA. And it tackles multiple problems. So it can treat depression, it can treat relationship problems, it can treat violence and substance use and trauma and even deals with safety and suicide. And as Kathy mentioned, lay people can deliver it. And what's interesting about this is you see around this wheel, none of these elements of CETA are new. These are all elements that have eons and eons of data on them. Um, CETA is really about just a new approach to teaching lay providers how to utilize these in different ways. So go ahead to the next slide. And Chambalelo, I'll hand it off to you. Um, thanks, Laura. Given the time, we've decided to just take a look at three elements, uh, namely thinking in a different way, part one, safety for violence and substance um, misuse. 
We particularly selected these three elements because the clients that we worked with on the project VATU here in Zambia reported that these particular elements attributed a lot of changes that they saw in themselves and the partners to the skills that they learned. Um, next slide, please. Oh, okay, great. So we're first going to start talking about this element called uh, thinking in a different way, part one. With this <clears throat> element, we define what thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are. And we also help clients con see how thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are connected. So I'd like us to pretend that I have a helpful thought of I do not want to be on this webinar and I'm so tired. Having this unhelpful thought could make me have feelings of bored and annoyed. So if you can see on the visual right in front of us, we have ratings on the feelings. So in, in thinking in a different way, part one, we always want to rate the intensity of feelings, one being the lowest intensity of that particular feeling and 10 being the highest intensity of the feeling. So I would be bored at a nine, which is very high and annoyed would be particularly high. Now, because of the thought that I have and the feelings and the intensity of the feelings, I would mount task. Now, if you follow the arrow onto the second triangle where I could choose to have a helpful thought, I might think I'm tired, but I can learn something new. Having this helpful thought could have, uh, I could have different intensity of my feelings. So I could be still bored, but my intensity would reduce to a five. I could still be annoyed, but the intensity here would be at a two. This would impact a different behavior where I would want to listen. So just by changing how we think about the situation, we can change how we feel and that could impact our behavior. Now, I would like us to take a close look at a real example from the work that we did in CETA here in Zambia. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so clients do not always have control over situations in their lives, but they can evaluate how they think about a situation to feel better. This is a form of one of the male clients that we had on the study. The situation that he wanted to work on was the wife refusing to have sex with him. So in the first uh, form that we have here, it shows the unhelpful uh, thoughts that he had, which were maybe she has a boyfriend, maybe she doesn't want me. And this made him feel angry. So if you look at the intensity of the anger, it's acted at an eight, which is pretty high. This made him force um, the wife to have sex. And then he went to drink using the money for food. If we can go to the next slide, please. Now we have a triangle even in the slide, but this is a helpful triangle. So it's the same situation. We're looking at the same client. So the, the situation is the wife refusing to, uh, to have sex with him. But in this particular case, he's changed his thought. He was able to arrive to a new thought by simply asking him if there's another way he could think about the situation that could make him feel less angry. So he suggested that he would think, why should he make his body suffer? He also thought maybe she doesn't want to get pregnant and she hasn't just told me. This made him feel bad, but if you look at the intensity, it was only at a five, he still went to drink, but then he had a positive behavior of talking to her. So you can see that by just changing how a client thinks about a situation, it can impact their feelings and behaviors. We use these skills on variety of stressful situations in a client's life, including triggers to drinking and triggers to violence. Next slide, please. So the next component we're going to look at is called safety for violence. This component is used to help clients talk about the violence in their homes and help them identify ways to keep safe themselves and their families. In this component, we use a worksheet to help the clients identify the major safety issues that they have. So for this particular client, her safety issue was the husband forcing her to have sex. She had to come up with a goal which was within her control, which was for him to understand when I'm not ready. In order for the client to be able to get to the goal, she had to come up with uh, possible solutions for this. So she came up with three. So the first one was talk to him when he's sober, have a family elder talk to him. And the last one was report him to our marriage counselor. Now, in this case, the, the 
client how to evaluate, she had to weigh the pros and the cons for each possible solution so that she could pick one that could not increase the risk for violence. So the client managed to pick having a family elder talk to, to him. And then now the counselor had to work with the client to break down the activity so that she can be able to do it during the week. Next slide, please. Thank you. So another element within CETA is dealing with individuals struggling with drinking too much. We do not force clients to change, but we work with clients to try help them reduce drinking any way possible. On this presentation, you will see the tool that we use to help clients reach their goal of reducing. In this activity, we help clients explore reasons why they're drinking and then specifically we teach them specific skills to help them with those reasons for drinking. For this particular client, he came up with a couple of reasons why he drinks. So I will only work like I will only go through one reason because we don't have a lot of time and show you the skill that the counselor was able to work with him. So the particular reason that we work on during our presentation is entertainment. For this reason, in session, the counselor was able to teach the client a skill of finding a new activity that he would do instead of drinking. So the client chose to go to church and sing. And then he also uh, chose to go and play soccer because the community where he's coming from, there was a football pitch that you could go and play twice in a week. These are actually very popular activities that men in Zambia do for entertainment. His goal for the week was also to reduce his drinking from six to four nights. And then <clears throat> he was going to stick to that and he was committed at a 10. Now I know this is a brief a snapshot of the components, but of course we are happy to send you more information if you're interested. And with that, I'll hand over the presentation to Maura. Great. So we hope that gave you a little bit of a look. Now we wanted to move into how, how is CETA implemented and give you a little insight into that. So you can go ahead to the next slide. And we're very eager to hear questions. Um, so please go ahead and, and chat those in or, or write those down so we can answer those. Um, go ahead and do two more clicks, I think, Kathy. So in most of the places that we go to, there's no mental health professionals. And so we are always training lay providers. And a common question we get for implementation is what do these lay providers need to sort of come with to, in order to be in this position? And what you see here is a list. And I would just say that the most important thing is they have an interest and a passion to want to do this work. We look for people that can talk to others, that know their communities, but really there's so much flexibility. We have found wonderful providers in so many different um, positions and with so many different backgrounds. So go ahead to the next slide. Great. So uh, I apologize, it looks like some of these slides are a little bit off now, but. Um, what we have here is an apprenticeship model. And what research tells us, which is very important, is that one-off trainings, so just doing an in-person training, is, has actually been determined by re research as almost 100% useless, so a complete waste of money. Um, and that's in all fields, education, health, mental health. And so more and more the apprenticeship model is used. And that's just as you would think for a plumber or a carpenter learning any trade, in that we don't just learn by someone talking to us for a while. We actually have to get our hands in there and do it with feedback and coaching and run into different situations. And that's exactly what this is. So in CETO, you can plan for about a 10 day, eight to 10 day in-person training and then everything's done locally. So for example, Chumbalelo ran practice groups and still does with new trainees where they just get a chance to, in their own comfort zone, practice these. And then they start with clients and the local supervisor carries them through that by meeting with them once a week. Okay, next slide. What do we actually, there we go. What do we actually teach? 
Um, CETA builds capacity well beyond those CETA elements. So as part of CETA, we teach about weekly monitoring, which is great for M&E and, and outcomes. We teach supervision skills. We teach safety protocols to deal with suicide, um, active violence. And then we also teach a lot about how do you actually integrate CETA into existing programs. So we don't leave an organization to figure that out on their own. We do consult on how do you choose providers? What would be the best place for this? Uh, how do you get buy-in in different areas? Okay, next slide. Another common question, and again, I, I hope we're answering some of the questions that hopefully we've peaked in some of you. What does a CETA, CETA provider job look like? The take home message here is that it's completely flexible. Uh, you could work one to two days, you could have a provider that works full time. We have providers that have been in community outreach um, positions and faith based organizations. We've also had students, we've had, um, we've had just about every type of um, person with every type of role. Supervision is about two hours a week, so keep that in mind when you look at the time someone's gonna work. And then location. The answer is again, anywhere. And what we really try to work with organizations with is not where we have done CETA, but where do they think CETA is gonna be best delivered in their community with their particular population? Okay, next slide. Again, for delivery, it's flexible. It can be group, can be individual. The spokes of that wheel, so the different elements of CETA, you could use one element, you could use a few elements, you could train in all elements. One of the things we do recognize as important is phone use, and that's usually more for safety cases. For example, if someone's saying they would like to commit suicide. We often are asked about payment. Again, very flexible. These could be new job lines for lay workers. They could be existing workers that maybe receive an increase given that they have a new skill and then their job description changes. Lots of different options. Okay, next slide. So for CETA, the number of sessions can also vary. And that's one of the beautiful things about CETA, we believe, but also something that's more scalable and sustainable and developed from a systems approach. So let's say that you're doing prevention work and you're working with a population that doesn't necessarily have problems yet. You might decide to do one session just on what Chambalelo talked about with the triangles, just to teach them a life skill. For mild problems, let's say you're working at a school with at-risk kids that you know have sort of lots of problems, but not necessarily, you know, full-blown sort of mental health challenges like depression or violence or substance use. You might just do three to five sessions. You might give them some skills. Um, for moderate to severe, CETA usually runs eight to 12 sessions. And again, that is not set. It's flexible because we only treat with CETA as long as someone needs. The length of sessions, they're usually around one hour, although can be very flexible. For example, sometimes we've had people travel in and it takes them so long to get somewhere that they prefer to come fewer times but have their sessions be two hours. The number of clients one can see a week, again, very flexible. We work with organizations to figure out the best way. We find the largest variable is do they have to travel? If they're just sitting at a clinic and clients are coming to you, uh, they can see a lot more in a day. If they're out in the community um, or traveling, then they're, the number they can see is usually lower. Okay, next slide. Great. So um, why would we wanna talk about evidence? Um, and I just wanted to share a, a quick story that um, I was working with a, provider once in, in the United States who, um, who did horse therapy. 
And she was very passionate about it. And we were talking about it. She was telling me about it and clearly had energy. And she, I said, well, you know, tell me, tell me what is it about horse therapy for you? And she said, you know, I just, I grew up with horses. I love horses. And um, I just think they're amazing animals. And then we got to talking about, she had actually a, a health scare in her family. And one of her family members had to go um, have heart surgery. And we ended up having a lengthy conversation. It was clearly on her mind about how she had uh, researched, gone to two doctors. The first doctor they really liked personally, but they were, he was talking about a procedure that that sounded great, um, but she couldn't find any information on it on the on the internet. And they went to a second doctor who was a little more cold as a, as a interpersonal surgeon. And but he talked about a method that she saw on the internet come up with studies and studies and studies. And so she was telling me, you know, as a family, we really decided that um, the second surgeon, we really liked that there was that there was information on it, that we knew how long the rehab, that we had read that there was thousands of patients that had gone through the same procedure. And so uh, what's interesting is that I, I think the reason we're passionate about sharing evidence, even though this is usually when people sort of start multitasking and get bored, is that we want the people all around the world to get access to the same treatment you would allow your daughter, your son, your niece, your aunt, your mother to get. And for most of us, that's really understanding, has this been proven effective? Okay, so next slide. Uh, these slides will be available to you, so I'm not gonna spend time on this, but what's important to take away from this is that there are multiple randomized trials, which is what you should always look for in, in, in any healthcare, showing that someone's actually been, something actually has been tried, tested in a controlled trial with a control group, um, and shown to be very safe and effective. Okay, next slide. There's, I don't know why these slides are cutting off. I'm so sorry. That actual top line says CETA is more effective than single focused treatments. And this is important to know in that we're really trying to change the messaging here and that single treatments are effective, but something like CETA is much more effective. You see those blue lines reaching out in effectiveness much higher than a trauma specific or nonspecific counseling. Okay, next slide. Great, and at the beginning, they, uh, Kathy had mentioned the, the VATU study, which was done in Zambia, where we specifically looked at CETA with violence and alcohol use. Okay, next slide. Only about five more minutes, everyone. So if you could hang on and keep those questions coming, that would be great. So what did the study in Zambia show? CETA significantly was more effective than the control on violence. So women, you see that pink line. Women in the CETA condition dropped so much more significantly um, than the control group on reported violence. Now, what's interesting is that this, these graphs looked the same by their male partners. So males and females were both reporting a large drop in violence. Okay, next slide. The other, mo the other really important thing is that there was a very large drop in alcohol use. Uh, and I know in many countries, this is a significant problem that's very tied to many issues, um, health issues, HIV, violence. And again, the CETA group had a very um, much more significant drop um, than the control group. Okay, next slide. So we like data that's both numbers-based, but also story-based. What you see here is just a report pre-treatment where a man actually says the story that he drinks money <clears throat> or he drinks alcohol to make him forget. He spends money that he doesn't have. He was evicted from his house. And he says when his wife talks too much, he beats her. 
Uh, the woman, of course, <clears throat> talks a lot about fighting and, and the husband being drunk and spending money on beer. And as many on the phone can understand, once you start getting into these patterns of spending money, there's a lot of other fallout. Kids aren't being sent to school, family dynamics change, et cetera. So next slide. And then here, what you can read is a story about post-treatment. And again, both, these are couples. So this is the same man and woman that, that were together. Um, the man's reporting, I used to drink every day, urinate on the bed. Um, these sessions really helped me learn changing. And what you see here is them actually commenting on specific elements. Chambalelo talked about changing unhelpful thoughts to more helpful thoughts. Um, learn not to blame um, and reduce drinking. The women's report talks about a story where the husband now comes home from work, which is in that substance use element, Chambalelo talked about one of the things we would work on is maybe rather than going to the bar, it's as simple as going, finding a way to go home. Uh, the woman says still drinks, but, but moderately. She has supported him, um, doesn't judge him. There's not as much shouting. So, and what's, what's fantastic about this is we saw whole family dynamics change, which is and, and has been shown in research to really be a generational outcome. Okay, next slide. We're into our last two slides, so I hope there's lots of questions and we've piqued your interest. The, the next stage now that we have multiple randomized clinical trials is bringing CETA to scale. And so we are trying to look at train the trainer models. And of course, uh, we're relying on evidence about how to do this. We, we know from research that most train the trainer models are, again, ineffective because they don't follow this apprenticeship model. So we have um, ongoing train the trainer programs um, and studies going. We are working more on messaging and getting buy-in from implementers and policymakers, and really trying to understand from folks like you on the phone, um, what are the challenges that you might see? What are the issues? And seeing if we can um, work through those. And then we're doing a lot about integrating CETA into existing programs. So not necessarily sort of starting a whole mental health program, but really understanding how it fits within nutrition and PMTCT models and ongoing violence work. Okay, and the final slide. Okay, so action plan. Um, please reach out to us. We are happy to answer questions. I think a, a lot of this is a first conversation about what does your program look like? What are you thinking? Some ideas that might help you. Um, start thinking about your setting. Are you in a clinic? Are you in a community? Could you be in either? Um, what might be the best way to reach the population you're um, focused on? Who might be your providers? Uh, and then uh, lots of questions we get, we can't answer until we also hear how many providers are you talking about? What's the main problem in your population? What are you mainly trying to address? So we are eager to have these conversations and we hope that you reach out to us. And I will stop there. Great, thank you very much to both of you um, for sharing um, your experience with this program and, and what you're doing and, and certainly the results. Um, while we're waiting for questions, um, maybe people could just, again, if you have any questions, put them into the chat box or just let us know that you would like to ask a question if you would, if you would prefer to, to verbalize your questions. Um, while we're waiting for people to do that, I have a couple of questions that we could kick us off. Um, one thing I'm wondering is how do you select the, the families or the individuals that you work with or that, that participate in this program? Um, and the other one is really around, you know, what conditions do you think, you started to talk about this at the end, but what conditions do you think are really critical um, for someone to consider if they were con to consider adopting this or, or taking this type of program to their um, to their setting, what do you think they really need to needs to be in place in order for it to work? 
Great questions to start yeah. us off. So I'll start with the first one. Um, how do you choose clients? I think this depends on the program a lot. I can run through a lot of different ways, uh, you know, for, for this particular study in Zambia, which was a study, we just went out into the community. Honestly, we had people who knew the community well, and we started talking in community groups about this is a, this is an offering. This is a program. Uh, they neighbors talked to some other neighbors that, that, thought they might benefit from this program and then word of mouth got out and there we were. Um, and we have so many different ways to do this. There's just not one way to choose clients. I think if you have an existing program, you may already have a client population, sometimes in clinics or for example, in faith-based organizations, they offer uh, screenings um, to assess whether, whether folks have problems Lots of times in organizations too, we just have people that give um, talks or there's a pamphlet or there's a radio program even just stating there's this service and here it is and everyone has these problems. I think the key with a program like, like CETA is that it can be anything you need it to be. So rather than starting with how do we choose clients, we would start with what problems are you trying to address? What is your population? And then work backwards from, well, then how do we best reach that, that population? Mm -hmm. um, and then Kathy, you had asked, I think that you had said the conditions to consider. Yeah, like what are the things that you think really need to, to be in place or the elements of, of this program, that this approach that need to be um, retained in, in sort of a, a fairly pure way in order for it to be um, to be successful in other contexts. And are you talking about implementation more or the elements of CETA? Um, either, whichever you think is more, um, is more critical. It's a great, it's a great question. It's a, it's a loaded question. Um, so let me see how I can start that and see if anyone has, has further questions on that. As far as set things that need to be in place, one of our main objectives is to make sure everyone has safety. Uh, in doing global work, we find a lot of organizations that are hesitant to ask about suicide, and yet everywhere we go, it's present, and there's many people who are thinking about it and, and even have plans. And so that, that is a no option thing that I think we're really trying to, to promote. So that would be something that you want to make sure you, you would integrate as far as needing to be in place. Uh, the other thing that needs to be in place as far as implementation is supervision. Again, we are, we're reliant on the research and we believe in the research that, that we don't want to do this without um, supervision. And I, and I think one of the things, Chambalelo, you might want to jump in here those providers rely on supervision. They enjoy it and they crave it. Is, is that right, Chambalelo? I know I've heard that from you before. Yes. Um, it's, it's, it's something that like, supervision is one area where they get to grow with their skill set um, and then also share the impacts that like for the virtual project was, it was during supervision that we got to learn a lot about what was actually happening in the community and the impact that CETA had on all the families. Yeah, and I, we leave a training and often the, you know, sometimes organizations are wondering about supervision because it is time. Uh, but I, I think that has been also at the end of a program where organizations and providers are saying this was the best thing. And then it sticks. So if you have about, let's say, six months with us, we can really embed those skills so that they're solid and that we know that, that things are being done well. Okay. So, um, as, and just as far as the actual elements of CETA, I think what's important for us is starting to think about a system of care rather than siloed care. So the same way we talk about, you know, we don't want to give providers like Chambalelo only one skill, and then she has to sit in front of these families that have all these problems and not know what to do. That, that's a really awful place. 
and it's a bad position to put our colleagues in. And so we're trying to get out of silos. We, we have to give multiple skills and we feel the same way about systems of care. So if we only integrate one element of CETA and provide prevention, then you're leaving someone out in the field who finds someone with more severe cases and can't do anything. So what we talk about usually is let's start thinking about a system of care where you might train a wider mass in only the safety part of this, but you might train a smaller group in the full CETA so that there's really a referral pattern for those that are affected by violence uh, that can get different levels of care. Mm. Okay, interesting. Great, well, again, if anyone online um, wants to ask a question, I have a couple other questions, but please do put them in the, um, in the text box. Um, one of the things, I think we went over this fairly quickly, so maybe I'll go back to it, but how sustainable are the changes? Um, so did you do some sort of longitudinal going back to the families and, um, and how long were families being able to sustain the sort of behavior changes that they adopted in the program? Did you have that here? That's a great question. So if you go back to the violence graph, yep, that one. So what we have is violence rates at the beginning and then post-treatment is um, fairly soon after. And then what you see there is a 12 months post-baseline. So a year out. Now in the care of violence and substance use and mental health, a year out is actually rare um, it is considered longitudinal data in our, in our field. Most people get post-treatment and that's it. Um, or for example, three, three or six months out. So what, we, what you see here is that there's very limited change from post-treatment to 12 months. So there is maintenance of that, of that um, decrease in violence. And just to talk to you a little bit about why, um, when you give programs where you're giving someone information or you're doing counseling in the sense of giving advice. What, reach, what research shows is if Chambalelo just kept giving advice and someone leaves her for a year, they keep needing to come back because Chambalelo is the one that solved all the problems, right? She's the one that gave all the advice. She's the one that had all the information. What's different about something like CETA is it's skill-based. So Chambalelo's teaching skills that they then use. And Chambalelo, I know, has told me tons of stories about how people have used something like those triangles, not only in relation to violence and substance use, but, but about everything else in their life that has happened over the past year. And so they really start generalizing these skills, which is why maintenance looks very good um, for CETA, but it's really because cognitive behavioral therapy, which is where this come from, comes from, has very good maintenance because it is skill-based. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's also really interesting. Um, we have some questions here, but I just wanted to note that you, have, you are noting that, that men are also reducing, um, reporting a drop in their perpetration of violence. So it's, it would, whereas not all studies have that same sort of, um, the same sort of behavior. Yes. We have a couple of questions um, in the chat box now that I wanted to share. So um, from, from Chandy, um, she's an HIV counselor and she finds that um, people are drinking while they're taking medication um, and wondering how she could focus on this issue. That's a great question. Uh, so we work a lot in HIV programs and um, the elements of CETA also work very well for retention and for changing behaviors around medication adherence. And so just to give you a, a concrete example, um, when someone is drinking while taking medication, um, we might do those triangles and teach them that and try to figure out what are they thinking? What's, the, what's their triangle before they, before they drink? Um, 
and what we find is that, for example, people say, some people say, I don't want to live anyway, so I'm just going to drink. Or another thought might be, drinking is the only thing that makes me forget how bad I feel when I take this medication. And so by understanding what their thought is before they go out and get a drink while they take medication, we can then shift some of their thoughts. What's a different way to, to think about this? Um, into trying to perhaps think about something else they can do, or um, maybe there's a knowledge gap there. The other thing is that oftentimes when we hear HIV programs and counselors say that people drink while taking medication, we might do that substance use um, part that Chambalelo also talked about to find out the reasons why they drink. And sometimes it has nothing to do with the medication. It has everything to do with um, being depressed or we heard a lot in, in many of our studies in Zambia that people drink because if you drink alcohol, the community thinks you're not HIV positive because you drink. And so people don't wanna stop drinking because then they'll think they're HIV positive or they'll know they're HIV positive. And so finding out about thoughts and what are the reasons they drink gets at changing that behavior. So lots of things you can do around that. Mm. Did that answer your question? Chandi, you can, you can chat back. We'll you let can her chat more. back and, yeah. and maybe take another question while she's sort of thinking about it and responding. Um, so Chris is asking, you know, they have very little in the way of places to refer people with serious mental health needs. I'm sure we're not alone in this. And what does CETA teach with regard to referral when there isn't much to refer people to? Yeah, and, and Krista, my question for you, if you could chat while I, while I respond, might be what, what do you consider serious mental health? Um, and if that's sort of very serious depression trauma, or if that's uh, something like schizophrenia or psychosis. And while she's responding, I'll just say that, so, so if we're talking about serious mental health in the lines of uh, they're very traumatized, they're very, um, they have a lot of substance use, et cetera, then uh, CETA is a place to refer. And that's what I'm talking about, sort of a system of referral uh, within an organization or within a, a, a country. Okay, Krista is talking about suicide risk. Oh, Krista, you're speaking our language. We, there is such a serious suicide risk everywhere we have worked. Um, and I, one of the biggest problems is that we don't ask. And we understand this fear, but nutrition programs don't ask. Most HIV programs don't ask. Um, TB programs don't ask. No one asks. And that's a big problem. And one of the things that we do in CETA is just teach them to ask. And in a training, we find that at first, counselors are a little bit hesitant. And so, for example, their first couple cases, they might call Chambalelo right away and say, oh my gosh, someone is sitting in front of me and they actually want to commit, they want to kill themselves and what do I do? And so the supervisors, the local supervisors play a big role at the beginning. And then what we find over time is that people become very comfortable integrating very simple initial plans to prevent suicide. Um, sometimes that looks like uh, just having someone watch them. Sometimes it looks like actually figuring out what their plan was and taking it away. And remember, the elements of CETA, we're simultaneously doing the elements of CETA, which helps with the underlying problem that's causing those suicidal thoughts. And I think that, again, is really critical. You can't treat just suicide in its little silo. You have to understand that someone is suicidal for a reason, and you have to treat those underlying problems. So we'd be very excited, Krista, to understand more about um, how we can help you with that. Great. So we're just about at the top of the hour, but we have two more really great questions. So I think we'll just, we'll take them. We started a bit late and hopefully people can stay on. Um, so Julia is saying, thanks for the presentation. It's very interesting. Uh, Vatu included a focus on violence and drinking. How do you decide which speci specific problems to focus on in each context? 
Great question, Julia. I'm, it's great to see you on this, this call. Um, so when we mentioned capacity building, what we train in CETA, we also train lay providers to assess for problems. And it's a, we do it in two ways. One, it's a very simple tool. It's about 10 to 15 items of sort of responding to, um, do you have nightmares? Do you have problems sleeping? Do you feel sad a lot? Um, very, very simple questions that help a lay provider understand where their main problem areas are. If you think back to that sort of bubble of comorbidity at the beginning of the slide. Uh, the other thing we train them in is trying to ask the client, what's, what's going on for you? What's your biggest problem? What, are, what is not working in your life? And we teach them how to do that. And then we have a procedure where they can sort of find out from these two ways, what are the biggest issues? If they have a traumatic experience, like they've been raped um, or they've been in a war and they're having a lot of nightmares, whatever, we sort of, we can tag that, okay, depression, trauma is the, the, the big hitter, but they clearly also have depression. They're indicating that they're sad most of the time. They looked really with, withdrawn. And then in CETA, that guides you to which elements you would use. And again, it sounds a little complicated, I think, as we explain it. All within this 10-day training, they don't only learn the elements, but they learn how to do this. And they do it well. They do it very well. Again, the apprenticeship model is key. When we leave a 10-day training or a 9-day training, someone like Chamba Lalo as a supervisor guides them through these choices of what to focus on a little bit more. And then just like if you were a carpenter or a plumber, over time you see and you get more and more confident, you know how to solve, you know, sort of make that decision on your own. Great. Thank you. This is all, I love this, this level of detail. It really kind of gives um, us so much more to go on. So last question from Danielle. Uh, first of all, thanks for the great presentation. I was wondering how is gender equity inserted into these sessions and issues? The idea of not losing one's family is a frequent motivation for seeking care for men and women, but then again, keeping the family at all costs is precisely a symptom of patriarchy and of gender inequality within the families. Oh, what a fantastic question. Um, those triangles for us get at very easily where they're sort of sitting and what their motivation is. And so I think we come into each case trying to say, we're not going to assume that anyone's coming in for any one reason or has any particular beliefs, but boy, does it come out quickly in those triangles. <laughs> and those triangles are a way to really question things like that um, as, as far as, you know, what their views are of the family and roles and things like that. What's interesting is that, and, and as I'm talking, Chambalelo, I don't know if you have a particular example that, that comes to mind, but in doing the study in Zambia, we heard, and I, you got a flavor of it from the qualitative slides that, that we presented, men started saying things like, I realized how much nicer my home was when there was money for food, right? When they started shifting some of that. Um, both of them talked about a, a greater appreciation for each other because the fighting had, had decreased. Sort of they learned a different way of communicating. And so, again, I feel like whenever we approach, if we approach gender um, equity, again, as a silo, I think that's why we're not getting as much effectiveness. Because for, I think gender equity is a loaded question. It has to do with how you see your roles, but also how you see the person you're with and what that communication pattern is. And do you come to the relationship saying, you have to do this and this is not my job? Or do you come to the relationship saying, let's work this out, let's talk it out? So I think there's a shift in relationships and communication that also really shift gender equity. Hmm. Just a quick follow-up to that. I'm just wondering if um, in the training of the lay providers, do you, you talk about gender equality, gender equity at all? We do, for yeah. sure. Yeah. And I, and I think, you know, folks like, so I will just say this. 
me as a, as a um, United States person, I, we raise the topic, but it's people like Chambalelo and the local providers, wherever we are, that really have the discussion around it and decide how to address it. Um, and that is a really nice process is that, you know, as trainer, as, a, as an outside trainer, I consider my role, I, I know the evidence, I know what works. I know that surgical procedure and I know what outcomes you're gonna get. But, but every lay provider is an equal contributor to that training where we say, how would this work in your environment? How would this work with your population? How would you say this best? So for example, when I leave a training, Chambalelo works so much with these lay providers in Zambia about, well, how do you say this? And how do you say it in Nianja and Bimba? And is that appropriate in this context? And they struggle with a lot of these issues. And I, you know, as I sort of listen in, but they're really making the decisions. So it's very um, adaptable. Mm -hmm. Great. So we're getting to um, the end of our sort of time here. I wonder if both of you could just give us an idea of what, when you're going into new places, you know, Chambalelo, you've been working, for example, in Myanmar, what would you, what would you, what would be one thing that you would, um, that you would share with people when you're starting to work with them in a new context on the setting? Maybe both of you could share sort of one thing. What's the top thing that you would want to tell people who are thinking about using this approach? Um, like working in a new environment the first thing that i always want to find out uh, what problems uh, have you found in your communities um and then talk about what sid has been able to do here in zambia giving them the evidence so that's the first thing that i go with i just want to find out the problems that they have and then also give some testimonies that have that we have here in Zambia. So that's great. That kind of like is a great platform for them to know what CETA is all about. And then it has nothing to do with culture because it can easily be adapted to their culture of that region. Because I think most people get to fear that it might interfere with our culture and they not, it might not be adapted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Laura? I think my message would be, this isn't as hard as it seems. I, I think that the some of the feedback we've gotten is, oh, we don't know how to do this. It sounds like a big program. I don't know. Nah, nah, nah. And, I, and I think uh, we would just go back to, I, I just don't think it's as challenging as you think. And we can help with so much, so many of the questions people usually have about um, how do I set this up? How do I integrate it into, into very, very diverse settings and programs? You don't, you don't have to be a mental health program to make sure your people are trained in how to address suicide. And, and, and we feel strongly about that or to integrate, you know, changing um, thoughts into a program to get a behavior change. Well, great. I mean, I think we could keep talking about this, um, but we are sort of at the end of our time. I'm just going to flip to the slide here um, so people have it that has Laura's email address on it. So if people are looking for more information, she's obviously put it out here so that you can contact her. Um, so please feel... Um, please feel free to, to get in touch and to ask any questions. Obviously, both her and Chambalelo feel very passionate about this approach and um, are happy to share that with us. Um, I do see that Leanne um, from What Works has joined us. Um, so Leanne, did you want to take a minute and just we um, and share a little bit about the What Works program and, and how you've worked together with, um, with the, the VATU folks in Zambia over the last few years? Hi, Kathy, and hi, everyone. Thank you so much. So um, thanks for the opportunity. And just to say that we're really, really pleased to be um, to have co-hosted with, um, with you. Um, I know you've put a lot of work into it. And thanks also to our colleagues, Laura, and the team in Zambia for presenting the work that's been fantastic, actually, in Zambia that we've been working with, for the, uh, with them on for the last while. Um, just for those of you who are not familiar with the What Works program, um, what works as a consortium has been spending the last five years or so generating new knowledge on um, what drives violence uh, among women and girls in, um, in the Africa, Asian and the Eastern area. 
Um, and we've also been working largely on in component one. So there are three components and in component one have been working largely on um, understanding what works in prevention by testing all of the um, interventions that, um, that we have in our portfolio. And Zam the Zambian CETA intervention is actually one of those interventions that, that was rigorously tested. And as you've heard over the last hour has um, proven to be very effective in uh, reducing both gender-based violence as well as um, alcohol abuse. So that, that is where the program, uh, the intervention is located within the program. Um, the other work we do as what works is the estimation of the costs of violence against women and girls. Um, social costs of violence against women and girls, but also cost effectiveness of the interventions. And so um, this year is a critical year for what works as most of the programs have completed their end line and their evaluations and we're concluding work on cost effectiveness of interventions. Uh, because it is the year that we will be able to answer the big question around what drives violence in um, selected contexts, what interventions work and what interventions do not work in particular settings and contexts, and what might a particular intervention cost you uh, if one to talk about taking that to scale. So that's really the work that we're looking at um, concluding uh, this year in 2019. Um, and it's work that's been undertaken in 13 countries uh, over the last five years. Great, thank you, Leanne. Um, and so this brings us to the end of our webinar. I just want to reiterate that we will be posting the, the webinar on the Prevention Collaborative website under the community area. You can find all of the webinars that we've done. And so they're available to, to watch and review on uh, YouTube. And so I do encourage you to um, share that. And we'll be sharing that link out with people who had registered in the next um, week or two. So it will be up and available for people who are interested in, um, in listening again or, or going back and reviewing some of the things. Um, so again, just thank you to um, Laura and Chambalelo for joining us. Uh, it was really interesting to hear about your experience and I appreciated the opportunity and, and also to, the, to those of you who joined, thank you for taking the time and thanks for those great questions. Um, I think we had the beginnings and got into some really good subject areas in a, the short amount of time that was available to us. So thank you for everyone's participation. Uh, with that, um, I think we're ready to... Uh, to end um, our session today. Again, thanks very much. And uh, we will look forward to gathering again next month when we look at another program around prevention of violence.